Hi, everyone. Welcome to GLF Live, a series from Landscape News and the Global Landscapes Forum of live interviews with experts on COVID-19. I'm Gabrielle Lipton, the editor of Landscape News, and today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Lawrence Haddad. Lawrence is the executive director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, also known as GAIN, and he's held this position since 2016. Before that, he's been a leading expert in global food security since earning his PhD in food research at Stanford in 1988. He served as director for the Institute of Development Studies, IDS, as well as director of the Food Consumption and Nutrition Division at the International Food Policy Research Institute, as well as on the high level panel of experts of the UN Committee on World Food Security. And in 2018, he received the prestigious World Food Prize. So we're very excited to have Lawrence here to speak on the linkages between COVID-19 and how it's affecting global food systems. And we'll have some time at the end for questions from the audience. So please type your questions in the chat box as we go along. So thank you so much for joining us, Lawrence. And I'll start with this. What changes to food systems have you already seen as a result of COVID-19? And what effects uh, of the pandemic on global food systems do you expect have yet to come? Um, thanks, Gabrielle. Thanks for inviting me to do this. It's so important that journalists are active and working and reporting on the right things. So thank you for, for doing this. So changes to food systems that we're already seeing I have been, you know, GAIN has 10 country offices in Africa and Asia, so we've been getting regular reports, situation reports from those 10 countries. And things that we're seeing are um, small and medium enterprises shutting um, uh, rapidly, the ones that are involved in the food supply chain, which is obviously really important. Food system workers uh, who are so vital from farmers all the way through to retailers, um, either getting sick or, or not being or not feeling well or being laid off or not getting food that they normally get uh, on in their workforce and workplace. So um, so those two things mean that food supply chains are really getting disrupted and broken and um, they're not working as smoothly as they should be. And we're seeing um, food shortages uh, in some places and food price spikes of some kinds of foods. Not so much the cereals and the root crops, but more the perishable, nutritious foods. What's still to come? I'm really worried. I'm, I'm deeply, deeply worried. If the GDP projections that we're seeing in Europe are likely to happen in Africa and Asia, and I see no reason why they won't, um, we're looking at really massive numbers of people being plunged into uh, two dollar a day poverty. Um, one estimate from the UN is 180 million. Um, that means and about 150 million of those are in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa and people below two dollars a day poverty typically are hungry. So I expect the hungry numbers to skyrocket if there's no action taken to avert this impending food crisis. And you know even more worryingly really is the the number of stunted kids because if uh, for every percentage GDP drop in countries with high burdens of stunting, we will see another 1.4 million stunted kids. So if there's a 10% reduction in GDP in Africa and Asia, which is what the estimates are for Europe, uh, we'll see another 14 million stunted kids. And those kids, uh, as you well know, will not be able to bounce back easily. If they're stunted in the first two years of life, they'll be carrying that stunting and that damage with them for the rest of their life. So I'm I'm really worried. Governments, international agencies, everybody needs to be fighting on two fronts, on the health front and on the food front. Mm. Going off of that, what recommendations would you make to policymakers, national and international, on how to mitigate risks to food supplies as best as possible? Well, um, the first thing is act now. Don't wait until the newspaper reports in your country start making, putting sort of unbearable pressure on you to do something. Be on the front foot. Act now. Don't wait for the don't wait for the headlines. Don't wait for the riots. We're already seeing food riots in South Africa. Don't wait for the riots. Don't wait for the headlines. Act now. 
if you avert the crisis or the, mitigate the worst effects of it, no one's going to criticize you for acting now. In fact, quite the opposite. So these are really no regrets kinds of actions. Act now. Second thing is keep your existing programs going. A lot of the existing um, social protection programs are stopping running or they're being downgraded. Um, food fortification is stopping in many countries because um, premix markets are not working terribly well. Immunization is, is stopping. Food distribution is stopping because people are clustering at food, food, uh, food pickup points and that's, that's, that goes against social distancing. Um, sometimes uh, food, pr food subsidy programs are reverting to grains and dropping pulses from the, from the, um, the food that's subsidized. So keep your existing social protection programs going. Uh, if you can't do school feeding because there's no school, find other ways of feeding the kids that are no longer in school. Issue vouchers that they can then redeem in small business for, with small businesses for nutritious food. So figure out ways to keep your programs going. Um, do something to support the demand drop. I mean, people are unemployed, their income is falling off a cliff. It was already very low. They're already spending 40% of their, their income on food. If they become even more impoverished, their demand will go down even further. And it won't really matter if you fix the supply chains up because no one will be able to afford any food. So you have to, uh, you have to get, you have to be really proactive and get loans and credits and grants uh, and liquidity uh, from your fiscal and monetary systems and international fiscal and monetary systems to get assistance to people to prop up demand. Um, then you need to then you need to do some stuff around um, supporting the kinds of things I was talking about earlier. Support your sm small and medium enterprises. Give them bridging loans. Many small and medium enterprises, these are the backbones of the food system in Africa and South Asia, but they don't have working capital to get them past a three-month um, delay in, in their creditors paying them. Uh, often a lot of these small businesses are owed money, but the people who owe them money can't give them the money. And they, uh, a three-month uh, loan will, be, will go a long way to keep them, keep them going. Um, keep the food system folks going. Uh, the people who work in the food systems through various income support programs. Um, keep physical food markets open. A lot of physical food markets are closing mm -hmm. because, uh, again, you can't congregate in a food market. There's a lot of population density. So instead, figure out some social distancing mechanisms for, for informal wet markets and food markets. Figure that out. Develop protocols for people who are serving food and delivering food and selling food. Get them the right equipment and, uh, and beef up your food safety regimes if you can. So these are just some of the things that governments can do, but really, there are, there are many, many different things and every government's going to have to figure out exactly what it, it needs to do. But it's, it all revolves around boosting demand, keeping supply going and making the enabling environment uh, work in terms of policy and finance. Mm -hmm. And as for private businesses and corporations, what role does the private sector play in this? And how have you seen the private sector take action so far? Well, um, now, the private sector is absolutely critical in all of this. Most people buy their, most people get their food, even in very poor countries, in rural areas. Most people acquire their food through purchases through the markets. So businesses, and that means and markets means businesses. So businesses are really, really critical. I think um, small business associations, uh, things like the Scaling Up Nutrition Business Network, they need to give SMEs in the food sector all the help they can get. They need to help the small businesses get ready to receive financial assistance when it comes. Many of the, the financial assistance that comes from domestic and international sources to small businesses will only go to the small businesses that can show they are ready to receive it. So they have to have decent business plans. They have to have all the right registration. They have to have you know a whole series of accreditations. And many small businesses don't have this. So a lot of the business associations need to support their members to get ready to receive bridging credit, working capital, and even small grants. The big businesses need to do more to support the small businesses. Um, you know, big businesses, in, in a way, didn't really want to um, invest too much in small in their in their own value chains in in Africa and Asia, 
because you know they've they they're happy with their value chains and they felt they were fairly robust but now their value chains are getting decimated by the lockdowns and so big businesses the smart ones will invest in their in their own value chains to make sure that when the lockdowns finish and economic activity begins to pick up those value chains their value chains will be ready to spring into action so the big businesses really through sort of doing the right thing but also from self-interest should be investing in their own value chains and that means doing business to business support in terms of ta and even finance to the smaller businesses that are that they are contractors with and partners with mm. how do you think this is going to affect the food systems of the global north and the global south differently well i think i think everyone has realized that uh, how important food systems are I think especially people in the north and people in the higher income contexts um, have probably thought more about food in the last month than they've ever thought about food. Um, certainly about food purchases. They think about food when they go out to a restaurant or take out food. But in terms of buying food in supermarkets or in markets and bringing it home and thinking about what they have in, in their storerooms and in their cupboards and their larders, they've probably thought about it more than ever. So I, I'm hoping that there will be an increased appreciation for um, food systems in in the north and an increased appreciation for the critical role that food system workers play. They're essentially essential workers. And um, I think certainly in the UK, we're seeing they are being recognized and applauded for the work they do. They're often exposing themselves to uh, COVID-19 uh, and um, and putting themselves in harm's way for the rest of us. Um, in the so, I think in the in the north, I think what we'll see in high income countries, we'll see more of a we'll see a bit of a decline in quality, perhaps in terms of what people are eating and what they're buying. On the one hand, people are cooking more for themselves, so that's probably improving the the quality of food they eat because food consumed at home tends to be lower in added salt, added fat, added sugar. Uh, on the other hand, they're consuming less takeout food from fast food joints, and so that's 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 good. On the other hand, they're probably consuming more packaged foods and less fresh foods. And some packaged foods is pretty unhealthy. Some is some is fine, and some is some is, is good is good. You know, canned vegetables, canned fruits, um, but some is some is not very healthy for you. So, I think from the, for the north, the picture is is quality. The the, the issues are. People will have enough food, pretty much. Food banks will kick in. There's enough wealth around to make sure that there are enough volunteers, there are enough food banks. So I don't think people are going to go, I don't think hunger numbers will go up much. I think the quality of what people eat will deteriorate so significantly, however. In the lower income uh, settings, I think it will be both quantity and quality. Quantity will, will go down and a lot more people will be hungry. And um, the quality of what people eat in terms of its nutritional value will go down simply because fruits, vegetables, eggs, um, animal source foods, anything that's perishable will go up in price um, because transport's so disrupted. You know, there's, there'll be piles of food rotting over here and there'll be shortages over there because you simply can't store it and move it around. <coughs> and I'm, I'm quite worried about food safety too because I think. Uh, in times of um, stress, in times of desperation, um, the, re the producers and retailers will be less careful about selling stuff that's gone off. They'll be more anxious and more incentivized to sell stuff that maybe is past its 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 uh, safety date. And consumers will be less fussy too. They will, will just be grateful to get their hands on anything they can get a hold of. So I'm a bit worried about food safety too. Do you have any recommendations or thoughts on how we should be handling food safety differently going forward? Well, you know, that's really that's a really complicated um, set of issues. What's hap what happened even before COVID was that food systems are evolving so quickly and changing and modernizing so quickly, uh, especially in Southeast Asia and some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, that the, the practices are outstripping the ability of the authorities to um, ensure that food is is safe. And you saw this in Europe and North America 100 and 120, 130 years ago. Um, food systems were outstripping 
the ability of the authorities to keep up in terms of ensuring food safety and preventing uh, adulteration of food. So um, essentially a lot more effort needs to be spent on food safety and a lot more um, we need to empower consumers to to highlight um, uh, the, the most egregious cases of food uh, adulteration and unsafe food practices and we um, we need to improve testing and we need to bring the food safety community together with the food and nutrition quality community a bit more the the nutrition community and the food safety community are sometimes very disconnected and the irony is you can eat if you can't eat safe food you won't have a nutritious diet uh, and even if you do eat safe food, but it's unhealthy food, you'll have an unhealthy and unsafe diet. So safe food doesn't mean you have a safe diet and uh, unsafe food means that you have uh, non-nutritious food, even if when it's safe, it's, it's very nutritious. So these two worlds have to work hand in glove more closely together. We're beginning to see that in India, the Food Standards uh, Agency is is very, uh, very important for food safety and is becoming increasingly important for nutrition. And I think that's that's got to be a good thing. Mm. How do you hope to see this pandemic be used to reshape global food systems for the better? Well, I think I think, first of all, everyone will have a different appreciation for food. I hope I hope that um, you know, people cooking more for themselves, people understanding the the social aspects and the social uh, the coming the bringing together of people around food uh, and the, the provenance and origins of food i'm hoping that that will probably recede but i'm hoping there'll be some lingering um, residue of appreciation that food isn't just fuel food is much more than just fuel and, and even much more than nourishment i think we'll begin to see uh, and understand a greater understanding of the vulnerability of long supply chains and long value chains. Um, and I think we'll begin to understand that we are sort of over dependent on very long and very, uh, yeah, very long value chains. A lot of a lot of good things can come in. A lot of good nutrition can come into long value chains, but a lot of bad nutrition can come in to long value chains, too. And the longer the value chains, the more weak link, the more links there are to be uh, weak uh, and, uh, and and to be disrupted. So while I, I'm not suggesting everyone goes back to growing food that's uh, to eating food that's grown within a five mile radius, uh, that that seems to me not the way to go. People will be thinking much more about the diversity of uh, food sources, not relying on so much on one food source. They'll be thinking a lot more about Plan B, Plan C, and Plan D when it comes to food security i think the resilience and diversity of production consumption the diversity of retailing and processing i think all of that stuff will um will, will change i think there'll be a greater appreciation of the role small and medium enterprises play small example from some of the some of the work we do again you know we talk about large-scale food fortification that's about 20 percent of our portfolio uh, when you talk about large-scale food fortification you think large-scale producers, but now that we're seeing SMEs going out of business and becoming inactive in a number of the countries where we work, we're seeing actually how pivotal these SMEs were and how integral they were to even large-scale food fortification. And that's something that I didn't realize uh, until this crisis. So I think you're seeing a, a renewed appreciation for SMEs. Uh, and I think, I think we're also, you know, a lot of the a lot of the responses have been um, around governments working with the private sectors in, in high income countries and in low income countries. And I'm hoping that there'll be a, a, a renewed uh, appreciation of at least the potential for public and private actors to work together to improve nutrition. Often it's not very good and it, often it's negative. Sometimes it's ineffective, but sometimes it can be positive. And I'm hoping this will highlight the positive uh, opportunities that exist. Mm -hmm. So through the course of this conversation, our audience has been taking a poll and 85% of them said that this crisis has changed their relationship with food. Uh, what advice or recommendations you mentioned before that we're all thinking so much about what we buy 
and we are. Um, so do you have any recommendations or advice on how much and what an average family or individual should be buying in times of crisis like this? Uh, no, I don't. I think I think the thing you have to do is avoid panic buying and avoid stockpiling because you're, you're just, you know, you're taking food away from your neighbors. Um, I think in high income countries, uh, I think the food systems are pretty resilient and they're 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 delivering uh, to, to people who are very high, highly susceptible to the virus. Um, they obviously need help in terms of getting food to them. And there's a there's a strong volunteer network and a strong um, a community network in many, many contexts, in many places. Um, my wife and my daughter are volunteering in our local area to deliver food. And I think that's happening in lots of different places. So you don't really need to stockpile food. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's not a good thing to do. In low income contexts, uh, you know, I think, I think the thing to do is just to be super careful about where you where you get your food from. And that's easy for me to say. But if you're if you're only eating rice every day and, and you're even beginning to miss meals, um, anything that's not rice uh, looks looks interesting. It looks tasty. It adds diversity. It adds some spice. Uh, it adds some variety to a very monotonous diet. So I think that's in a low income context. It's, it's just really difficult. The thing is, just be careful about about the safety of the food. If it smells bad or looks bad, unless you're absolutely desperate, don't eat it. Mm, thank you. And then this is my last question before we go to questions from the audience. What have you learned from this crisis? Um, I think I think I've learned um, a couple of things. Um, I was looking just just because I, we're, we're trying to sort of get we're trying to wake everybody up in the um, in the development world and uh, in the UN system and in the international sphere to wake up to the food crisis. And I was looking back at some of the work I did back in 2007 and 2008 to the last food price crisis. And I think I think there's a there's a real a tendency to to for, to forget that um, yes this this COVID crisis is like nothing we've seen before. But the mechanisms that it shuts down and the consequences that that generates are are predictable. It, this is it is predictable that there will be a food crisis unless we make sure farmers can get inputs, unless we make sure that um, food can get out of, off the farm into the distribution channels, unless we ensure SMEs can work, unless we ensure food system workers can operate and have an income, unless we can. Uh, can assure consumers have an income to buy the food. I mean, all of that is is very predictable, even though even though COVID itself is is unprecedented. So, I think the the first thing to learn is that history has a habit of repeating itself, but it does so in a fairly predictable way. So that's really important. I think one of the I think the two big surprises for me has been the the really essential nature of food system workers. You know, you kind of get it, you kind of understand it. At a conceptual level, but until you see, you know, deserted aisles, uh, vans being uh, not driven, uh, food rotting in food storage spaces, food rotting on a farm, until you see that, you don't really get a, 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 an appreciation of the essential nature of food system workers and their frontline, the frontline uh, way they work and expose themselves to risks and dangers. And I think. The, the sort of the the thing I've I've read about the most is uh, zoonoses, the the ability of viruses to jump species from animals to humans, and um, I'm just realizing how lucky we've been until this point, and uh, and that this this may be the 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 end of the of the zoonoses that um, we experience as a as a human race, and how we need to all be much more careful about the about encroaching on uh, wildlife spaces and about uh, food safety when it comes to live animals in markets uh, next to other kinds of other kinds of foods. So I think the whole area of zoonoses is one that I've I've developed a, a greater appreciation for over. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. So one of our audience questions comes from Emmanuel Atamba, and this is related to our relationship with animals. And he's asking your advice on the role of industrial animal agriculture and such diseases like this, um, which complicate our health more. And he's wondering if a plant-based way of life and diet is more sustainable and safe in your opinion. Well, this is a, it's a really difficult question to be, um, to be you know, definitive about because first of all, a lot of plant-based foods can be super unhealthy. Um, think about, think about impossible burgers um that's a, kind of a silly example but plant-based but very high in sugar very high in fat very high in salt um yeah lot, lots of calories um but there are lots of other plant-based foods that are not particularly healthy because they're they're processed in a certain way uh similarly animal source foods um there's lots of different ways of producing animals there's ways that are very respectful of the environment and respectful of animal welfare and there's ways that are not. So I think it's really hard to be um, black or white about any of this. Uh, I think you've just got to have principles, and the principles are that human health, environmental well-being, uh, and livelihoods are sort of indivisible. You, you just like human rights, you don't pick which human rights you respect, protect, and facilitate. You you have to either adopt all of them or, or reject all of them. Uh, and I think it's the same with um, health, livelihoods, hunger reduction, and environmental sustainability. You have to view them as indivisible. And when you begin to view them as indivisible, then you begin to see how complicated the, the trade-offs are uh, across actions. So um, I, my suggestion would be to refrain from uh, binary, this is good, this is bad, and try and stick to the principles and see if the actions uh, support the the principles of does this reduce hunger? Does it improve health? Does it strengthen livelihoods? And does it does it uh, support the environment? And when and there will be trade offs between those. Sometimes no, but most of the time yes. And as long as you understand the trade offs and are willing to defend your choice, uh, I think that's fine. But but resist mm. resist easy dichotomies. They don't work. Mm. This comes from John, who's asking about food waste uh, at home and in transport. It's one of our greatest challenges. Uh, so could the COVID experience change our behavior? And is there something governments and others could do to support changing our relationship with food waste? Yeah, I mean, again, it depends which context you're thinking of. In a high income context, I think people are not are being being much more careful about um, throwing out a potato because it looks slightly green um, or, or it you know there's a bit of mold on that so I'm not going to eat any of it I think people are getting better at eating everything in their larder and in their fridge so I think food waste in high-income countries is going down food loss in the food system in high-income countries tends to be low simply because it, economically it makes sense for the the um, the producers and distributors and processors to keep it low. In low-income contexts, um, food waste, uh, sorry, food waste is very low anyway because people can't afford to waste food. Uh, and I think food loss is the, to me, food loss in low-income settings is is a really difficult issue. And that's the, that's the big issue. Uh, and notice how I'm breaking it down into high-income, low-income, food loss, food waste. It, it, it's a four-cell problem. And that, that food uh, loss in a low-income setting is so dependent on infrastructure. And so much of the infrastructure is, is old and decrepit and crumbling and is really expensive to fix up. So we're looking for technology that's going to help us leapfrog the old infrastructure in much the same way that um, mobile phones have helped us leapfrog the old telecoms infrastructure. But I don't know what that's going to be. I'm still looking for the $5 refrigerator um, or something that's going to uh, help us transport food quickly and efficiently um, in a very low carbon way. And I, I don't know what that, what that technology is going to be, but I'm looking to technology for that. <coughs> there may be some really good innovations that are institutional innovations that can help uh, minimize food loss. 
in Lurkham settings, but I haven't seen too many of them. I think it's an area ripe for creativity, both on the technological front and on the institutional arrangement front. For example, why isn't there a um, why isn't there an Uber for an Uber mechanism, a, 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 a shared economy solution to uh, moving food around? Well, a lot of it's because people who operate markets just demand a, a premium for entering those markets, a rent for entering those markets. And there's a lot of there's a lot of powerful uh, mafia types that run these markets. So something like a shared economy is not really going to work. But um, mm -hmm. nevertheless, I, I think there's huge scope for technological solutions and uh, institutional innovations in the food loss low income setting. Mm -hmm. This comes from Jeff Kersey. Uh, he's wondering general, generally if you can speak a bit more about problems of long value chains versus going toward more local production opportunities. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't I don't think I necessarily have a problem with long value chains. I think it's all about the balance because long value chains tend to be, and I'm speaking in gross generalities here, they tend to be uh, they tend to result in cheaper food because you can usually produce the food in places where it's it, it, the comparative advantage of growing the food is the best. It's the most um, economically efficient place to produce the food. That's where I'm going to produce it. And then I'm going to get it to uh, the people who need it in a, in a you know, a reliable, resilient, uh, long value chain. But of course, value chains, as we've seen, and supply chains are not always reliable and they're not always resilient. And they do depend very much on the ability to move around. They depend on just-in-time technology. So if you move to shorter value chains, you you gain, I think, in terms of resilience. You gain in terms of pro provenance of food. You know more about where it comes from. But you may uh, pay the price in terms of uh, more expensive food because um, where you're sourcing the food from may not be the best place for it to be grown in the first place. So. I mean, that's just that's just one trade-off. There will be other trade-offs too. But so it's not it's not easy again to be definitive about it. But I think I think the dependence on long value chains and maybe the number of the small number of long value chains um, is something to rethink post COVID. Mm -hmm. And then this will be our last question. It comes from Jonathan, who's in France, and you've spoken a lot through the course of this conversation about safe food. So going forward into the future with access to safe food, are there any um, are there any multiple benefit offering practices that you think could play a major role in that, such as agroforestry or small scale farming, anything that you think can really bring safety along with other benefits to our food systems? Well, again, you know, it's, it's it always sounds really simple, but it's not. So you think, well, yes, of course, if you use less fertilizer, less herbicides, less insecticides, uh, our food's going to be safer. Uh, so yes, it might be, uh, but it probably will also be more expensive as well. Um, so uh, you know, there there are trade-offs everywhere. It's about getting the balance right, and that's why that's why we have managers, and that's why we have policymakers. Policymakers are uh, there to their job and the politicians and policymakers their job is to um, balance what a society will tolerate and will accept social norms with techno technology and economics um, so if you go too far on one extreme and you sort of ignore societal values and norms you get into a very really sort of instrumentalist utilitarian world where efficiency is everything and then if you get too much into um, putting social norms above and beyond everything, um, including the affordability of food and the availability of food for the bottom third of the population. And that's also not, that that's a social value that you have to then question. So policymakers and managers, their job is to balance all of those different um, considerations. And it's, it's not easy because food, everyone consumes food. Everyone feels they're an expert on food. And in a, in a way they are an expert on food. And everyone has a very strong opinion about food because it's something that touches all of us uh, economically, nutritionally, and and socially, and also in terms of identity, who we are. So it's a it's a very charged topic, uh, and um, we always have to be very aware of the context. 
um, what seems sensible in the UK or in Germany is completely nonsensical in Mozambique and Ethiopia. It could be completely nonsensical and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Well, Lawrence, it's been such a pleasure and thank you so much for adding all these nuances to the conversation. You've really pointed out an amazing number of intricacies to the food system that we need to keep in mind going forward. So we really appreciate your expertise. And to everyone who joined us, thank you for your time. And next Monday, we're gonna be speaking with um, Director General of C4, Robert Nasi, and Anika Tarana, a researcher from WWF about the relationship between COVID-19 and deforestation. So please join us back. And thank you again, Lawrence. We so appreciate thank your you. time. Thank you, Gabrielle. And thanks for all the great questions, guys. Really